we know what's causing cancer. So that's the question I ask every cancer patient now. Do you want to live? Chris, do you believe God gave you cancer? Cancer is now the leading cause of death in 22 states. Chris Warwick was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer in 2003. After surgery, he opted out of chemotherapy and instead used nutrition and natural therapies to heal. Today, he is cancer free. And this is how Chris beat cancer. The message was clear. If you don't do this, you're gonna die. The number one cause of cancer is My intention for today is really just for us to have a conversation. And my hope is that whatever we talk about, stories, wisdom, insights, facts, that what transpires makes a difference for whoever's listening. And so I want you to know that's like the space yeah. where we're having this Good. in. And, and you are someone who I really look at as doing God's work. Me and I, I say that with all seriousness. Your book, Chris Beat Cancer, is one of the most inspiring books I've ever read. I just want to dive right into yeah. it. Take take us to when you got your cancer diagnosis, where you were in your life. So I was diagnosed at 26 years old, December 2003. And this was after the better part of the year having random abdominal pain. And uh, it was a weird thing because it was it was not an everyday pain. Some some days I'd feel great, other days I would have little twinges of pain, and so I just kept putting it off, thinking, "Well, I guess it's not that big of a deal. I don't know what's going on." But it, it wasn't enough to like really motivate me to go to the doctor. But eventually the pain progressed, and it got to be where within forty five minutes to an hour after every meal, I would start to like cramp up and feel mm -hmm. really bad. So I had this colonoscopy after being referred, you know, it's like you go to the doctor and they're like, we don't know, we'll send you this guy. Yeah, so I was like passed around a lot. <laughs> but eventually someone was like, I guess we'll do a colonoscopy on this 26 year old and see if there's anything going on in there. And uh, that's when they saw a golf ball sized tumor in my colon, which if anybody doesn't know what the colon is, that's your large intestine. And uh, so they biopsied it, sent it to the lab and called me a couple of days later and like, look, you've got colon cancer and we got to get you into surgery right away and get this thing out of you before it spreads and kills you. Wow. So, you know, I mean, it was a huge shock, obviously. Cancer diagnosis at any age is, is a traumatic experience. I mean, their cancer patients often have PTSD symptoms from the diagnosis. Like it's that life-changing. It's, it's something that you just can't even describe. But anyway, so at that moment in my life, I was completely unprepared for the diagnosis. I was a clueless cancer patient. I had no real, real friends or family that had ever had cancer. I'd never watched anyone go through it. You know, like today, almost everybody knows someone close to them who's gone through cancer treatment, right? They've seen what that experience is like. And I hadn't. And so I just assumed that the conventional medical model was just, this is what you have to do. You just got to do what the doctor says. And so they wanted to have me in surgery immediately. And this was just a few days before Christmas. So they were trying to check me in the hospital for surgery, like right before Christmas. And, and that's the way it goes for cancer patients. I mean, it's a whirlwind. As soon as you're diagnosed, uh, you are rushed into treatment out of fear. And when you're in a state of fear, you can't make a good decision. You can't make a rational, reasonable, thoughtful, well-researched decision when you're in a state of fear. When you're in a state of fear, you act in a way that's very impulsive and irrational. And you're easily manipulated when you're in a state of fear. And so this is how cancer patients are treated and so as soon as there's a diagnosis, it starts, you need surgery right away, chemo right away, radiation right away, depends on the cancer. And once you get on that cancer train, it's very hard to get off because it's like, it's like a bullet train, man. You get on and it's just like, zoom, you're off, you know, and it's, it's scary. It's like jumping from a moving train. Like it's really scary. And patients tell me all the time, like I'm in the middle of this treatment and I, you know, I, I don't want to be doing it and I'm just too scared to stop. 
that's like a horrible thing, you know? They're too afraid to stop, to say no to something that they don't want to do. So, of course, this is perspective that I've learned, <laughs> right? This is not, these are not things I knew at the time right. or understood. I was in the middle of it and uh, basically I just thought, well, I just don't want to be in the hospital on Christmas. So can we postpone the surgery till after Christmas? And I go in on December 30th. They, they said, okay. They took out a third of my large intestine. That's where the tumor was. When I woke up from surgery, they said, it's worse than we thought. We were hoping you'd be stage two but you're stage three, and that means it's spread to your lymph nodes. We took, we took out everything we could see, but you're gonna need chemotherapy. And the reason is because cancer cells are microscopic, right? So you can have you know millions of cancer cells in your body, even billions that are undetected if they're not clustered into a lesion or a tumor. So the cancer industry knows that surgery uh, does not remove all the cancer, right? Because you have circulating tumor cells, also known as circulating stem cells, cancer stem cells, that are circulating in your body, looking for other places to set up camp and start reproducing and form new tumors. Well, you also have an immune system. And there are specialized immune cells, natural killer cells, T cells, helper cells, B cells. Their job is to identify and eliminate cancerous cells in your body. Like that's what they do for you. That's what they're doing for you right now. Right? It's good. Mm. And the difference between a person with tumors and a person with no tumors is largely due to their immune system, how well it's functioning. So again, things I didn't know, <laughs> but I'm in the hospital. I've, you know, I'm on heavy pain medication they're telling me you need chemotherapy. And I'm just like, okay, right. Uh, I guess this is my life now. And two things happened in the hospital, which of course I talk about in my book that are worth repeating that got the wheels turning a little bit. And the first thing was that the first meal that they served me after taking out a third of my large intestine was a sloppy Joe. The sloppy Joe is the one food group that you can't find at restaurants because <laughs> nobody likes them, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sloppy Joes are like, this is what you get at summer camp or if you're in the military, right? Or mm. definitely in prison, mm. like prison food. And this is what they're serving in the hospital to a, a guy who just had cancer surgery and to another guy who just had a quadruple bypass down the hall. It's like, it was insane to see that just horrible industrial cafeteria food being served to me just on a, you know, on a lunch tray in my lap in a hospital bed. So, you know, I'm thinking like, why are they serving this horrible, unhealthy food to sick people? Like this doesn't make any sense. A few days later, I was recovering well. And they said, you get to go home today. And the surgeon came in and I'm talking to him and, and I just happened to say, Hey, you know, is there any food I need to avoid? And his answer was, and, and by the way, I asked that question because I genuinely wanted to make sure I didn't screw up the surgery. Like, you know, like is hot sauce going to melt the stitches on the inside or whatever? And his answer is like, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. That's it. No dietary advice at all. I mean, literally just made a joke about don't lift anything heavy and really gave me permission to drink beer, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. What's the underlying message? It's like, it doesn't matter what you eat. So I, I, I saw this, again, this confirmation that the, the healthcare industry, the medical system, the doctors don't care what you eat. They don't think diet matters. So I go home and I'm recovering from surgery and I'm weaning myself off the pain medication. And as I sobered up, I just started to think about my life and my health and my future and like what is to become of me. And I had seen cancer patients in the world, right? I'd seen chemo patients. And I'll never forget the very first time I saw one, you probably remember too, like the very first time you ever saw an advanced cancer patient, like in the wild, it was, you know, it was alarming to see another human in that physical condition where they're emaciated, there's no, they have no hair, right? Their, their face is sunken in, their, their skin's yellow. You're just like, 
oh my gosh. Like I can remember like asking my mom, like, what's wrong with that guy being a little kid? And so now I realize like that is what I'm going to become. This is like my future. And uh, I didn't feel real good about that. <laughs> you know, I mean, as most cancer patients don't want to do chemo, they don't want to have their body wrecked, but I didn't know what else to do. You know, I was just, it was, I had a conflict, right. That I just didn't know how to resolve. And I prayed about it and just said, God, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me. Like I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. And I just, I was like, God, I trust you to supply all my needs. And I trust you to make a way for me. And it was just a simple prayer of faith and, and desperation, you know? Two days later, I got a book that was sent to me from a friend of my dad's who lives in Alaska. So I'm in Memphis. This guy in Alaska sends me a book written by another guy who lives in, I guess he was living in North Carolina, but that's George Malcolmus. So George had colon cancer in the 1970s, and uh, he was a pastor, and he had seen a lot of church members and his own mother be diagnosed with cancer and go through treatment and suffer and die. Then he finds out he has cancer and just made a decision like, well, I don't want to do that because it's, you know, I've just seen it not help a lot of people. And he happened to have a friend who said, man, you need to get on a raw food diet. You need to go back to the Garden of Eden. You need to eat raw fruits and vegetables, right? And you should probably start drinking carrot juice. <laughs> so I'm reading his story, man, and I just start crying. I mean, I'm like sitting on the couch in my house, just like tearing up choked up, like, because I just knew, like, this was an answer to my prayer. Like, I prayed, and this showed up, and I was so encouraged and, like, overwhelmed, really, overwhelmed with gratitude that this man's story had come into my life at that moment when I needed it, you know? And it's crazy, like, sometimes one person showing up in your life, right, at the right moment, like, totally changes the direction of your life. And so that was George Malcolmus for me. And his story in a nutshell is that he converted to a raw food diet, started juicing, and within a year, his tumor had healed. No cancer. I was like, well, man, sh you know, if he was able to heal cancer, why can't I? We're both human and we even have the same kind of cancer, <laughs> you know? So I was like, I'm doing it. Like, I'm all in. Like, I didn't think twice about it. There was no deliberation. It was like, I'm going straight to the grocery store, Whole Foods. And buying a bunch of vegetables that I've never eaten before and buying a juicer, Whole Foods used to sell juicers, and, uh, and a 25-pound bag of carrots. And like, I'm doing this. Like, so I converted to a raw food diet overnight. It's like mm -hmm. immediate. I was <laughs> so excited about this, but most of the people around me were not. And uh, that's when it got started to get difficult. Because, you know, I, I can remember calling my wife at work and like, as I was reading the book, you know, that first day and I was like, oh my gosh, I got this book. And I was trying to tell her the story. I was probably talking a hundred miles an hour and like, this this guy and he healed cancer with, with raw food. And by the way, in January, 2004, nobody knew what a raw food diet was. Right. Like it wasn't, I had never heard of it. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know people only ate raw raw fruits and vegetables, and, uh, and and there were no there were no like hipsters on Instagram, you know, posting beautiful pictures of their raw food meals, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I found out quickly like this is a diet for sick people and weirdos. <laughs> right? Fortunately, I checked both of those boxes. So I was like, perfect. <laughs> like, I can. This is a diet for me, um, and so. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to explain all this to my wife about how excited I am. And, and she, she didn't, you know, didn't understand. Right. And just, just to be clear, you're, you're not only telling her that you're going to adopt this or you're adopting this new diet, but you're also foregoing the treatment, the chemotherapy being prescribed to you. I was basically giving her the impression that I was not wanting to do chemotherapy. Yeah. Right. I hadn't like made up my mind, but I was really feeling like this was the way I wanted to go. 
And so I started getting calls from family members, like word spreads really fast in, in our family anyway. And, and people were calling and saying like, you've got to do chemo. You've got to do what the doctor says. Don't you think if there's something better, they'd know about it? Like, you know, I know somebody that tried alternative therapy and they died. You know, I'm like hearing these kind of stories from people. And it really sent me into a bit of a tailspin because like on one hand, like I prayed, I got this answer, I got this clear direction and a path. And then everyone around me is saying like, no, don't, don't go that way. Like you can't do that. <laughs> well, what do you do? Right? It's like, you've got this conviction that you, there's something that you have to do and you must do and no one else understands. And like, that was really hard, man. Like it was, it was really, really difficult. And again, everyone in my life that was against me was actually for me, right? They all loved me. They didn't want me to die. And they, they thought I was being, you know, foolish or, or stubborn, or, um, uh, maybe I was, had my head in the sand, you know, um, and was getting, you know, misled by some quack, that kind of stuff. And so I, uh, I reluctantly agreed to go meet with an oncologist because, you know, I was getting a lot of pressure from the family to do that. And about a weekend to my, to the raw food diet, we go to this oncology clinic and, you know, just had a really rough experience. Uh, the waiting room was full of old people. And I looked around and I was like, God, I don't belong here. Like, I, I can't believe I'm here. This doesn't even make sense, you know? And I'm sitting there waiting to go back and Jack LaLanne comes on the TV. Yeah. See, if this, things have changed so much. Back then, they would have a TV in the waiting room at the cancer clinic and it would just be TV, right? Mm -hmm. Now the TV has like pre-programmed information yeah. about treatment yeah. and medical stuff. Yes. But back then it was just like, you know... NBC, the morning shows, but Jack LaLanne comes out on one of the morning shows and starts talking about raw foods and juicing. And he says, if man made it, don't eat it. Yes. You know, he's, he's just going off. And I'm like, this is like a miracle right now. If man made it, don't eat it. Yeah. Cause he was preaching to me, you know, in that moment. And I needed that confirmation so bad. Cause I was struggling like with fear and doubt, you know? And there's no scarier place to be than the cancer clinic. I mean, this is the fear factory where patients are manipulated out of fear and coerced into treatments that they don't understand. We eventually go back to see the oncologist and he, you know, he treated us just like, you know, next, who are you? Flip through the chart. Okay, you got stage three colon cancer. You're, you're a young adult. It's very aggressive in young adults and you're going to need 5-FU and leucovorin. That's a chemotherapy regimen. The regimen they were pre prescribing at that time and... And I just happened to say, you know, well, well is there, um, are there, it, what about the raw food diet? So I was on it. And he said, no, you can't do that. It'll fight the chemo. And I said, uh, well, are, you know, are there any alternative therapies available or, <laughs> you know, I was a pretty timid guy. Like I wasn't in there trying to argue about, I didn't know anything. Uh, and his, but his demeanor just changed. Like, it's like he flipped a switch and it, like, as soon as I said, are there any alternative therapies available? He was like, no, there are none. If you don't do chemotherapy, you're insane. And then he just kept talking and talking and talking. Like, it just would not stop talking. Like, pulling out every arrow in his quiver to convince me to do chemo. And, you know, the message was clear. If you don't do this, you're going to die. And by the time he finished, I mean, I didn't say anything else. And he talked for, I don't know how long, you know, minutes. By the time he finished, and I guess he was satisfied with his pitch, and we concluded the meeting, I was so in such a state of fear. And I just went, you know, I walked out of there and I went to the desk and made an appointment to get a port put in to start chemo in like three or four weeks. And then my wife and I walked to her car and we, I mean, I was destroyed, man. I was hopeless, discouraged. We just sat in her car and held hands and just cried, man. And I just choked out a prayer. You know, I, mean, I was so down. I was so beat down. And my experience was not unique, right? This is like every patient walking. I mean, if you go to a cancer clinic and just watch people walk out the door to their cars. 
It's rough. I'm so thankful though, because I had, you know, this three or four week window to really do some soul searching. Like they couldn't start chemo yet because I was still recovering from the surgery. And a lot of patients, they're just rushed in before they even, you know, they even know what's happening. And so I just go home and it's like, what am I going to do? You know, I've got, I've got some time. I've got to figure this out. So I just kept reading and researching and praying and I fired up the juicer. You know, I'm like, well, I'm definitely doing this. You know, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm definitely doing this right now. And uh, then the day came, you know, to, to get the port put in for chemotherapy. And I woke up that morning and I was just like, I'm not doing it. Maybe later, but not now. And I had a very clear revelation that of what I wanted, like what my intention was, and that was to build my body up. I wanted to restore my body. I wanted to heal it. I wanted to build it up. I didn't want to tear it down. And even though I didn't know much about chemotherapy, I just knew they were highly toxic, right? These are highly toxic drugs, and I'd seen what they'd done to people. And, and I was like, that's not what I want to do. I'm, if I'm going to live or die, I'm going to live or die on my own terms. And so didn't go. <laughs> And the cancer clinic starts calling the house, you know, and uh, it's so funny, like they were calling and this is back when, you know, people had answering machines and the, so there's the answering machines like sitting by the phone and it has like the blinking light, you know, if you have a message, there's a like, little light blinking and I would come home from work or whatever and I'd see the light blinking and I wouldn't even press play. Like, I, like that's how triggering it was just to hear the like, Beep, like this is a cancer clinic calling. Please call us to schedule your appointment that you missed, or reschedule your appointment, that kind of thing. But I held off long enough that they just eventually left me alone. And then they sent me a certified letter that I had to sign for, which was weird too. And it was basically them absolving themselves of right. me. Like we've we've done our best to convince this patient he he, you know, we're not responsible for him anymore. So then I was off the hook and I was free, but I still had a lot of tension, like, you know, with the people around me who didn't understand. And my mom was the only person in the beginning that was a big supporter of me because she had had stacks and stacks of books on raw food and alternative cancer treatments and natural remedies and holistic health. Like she is just a voracious reader. And for 30 years, since the 1970s, she had just been buying books every week at the health food store and reading them, you know, Paul Bragg, Pablo Areola, like all these legends. And Did you know that she was reading those things? I mean, I knew my mom read a lot of books. Yeah. Right. Like there was always probably f five or 10 books stacked on her nightstand. Uh -huh. Right. Just constantly just reading, but I didn't, didn't pay attention, you know? And of course I knew she liked to go to the health food store because we'd always have weird stuff in the fridge like sprouts. Hey. Right. Like none of my other friends had sprouts in the fridge. Uh, none of my other friends had kefir in the fridge. Uh -huh. Um, or like, <laughs> <laughs> like, or like chips made out of kelp and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we would have stuff like that in the house, but she wasn't like a hardcore crunchy mom. Like, like she wasn't a vegetarian or a vegan, right? My first birthday was at a McDonald's, you know what I mean? Like I had a very normal suburban, mm -hmm. like sort of upbringing, but s s with some supplements and healthy stuff sprinkled in. <laughs> right. So... And my mom had never been sick. She'd never had a, a you know major illness. She'd never had a chronic health problem. She just was really into prevention. Had stacks of prevention magazine on the toilet. I mean, so anyway, turns out she had all these books that I wanted to read. You know, I start telling her about like, have you heard about this or the raw food diet or that? She's like, oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got some books about that. I've got this book and that book and oh, you might like this and you might, you know, Dr. Lorraine Day and... And um, Dr. Richard Schultz and a cancer battle plan and from like all of a sudden, like she became like my librarian, <laughs> which was another miracle. And uh, to me, I mean, at that time, there was no social media, there was no YouTube, there was nowhere for me to find support. Like I was totally alone. And I talk about this in my book about like, it felt like I was hacking my way through the jungle, yeah. you know? Like there's the path that everybody goes down and that's the, the, the paved road that's brightly lit. And if you're doing cancer, you know, conventional cancer treatment, it's like, you just imagine like the, 
you know, the, the pink ribbon races where everybody's like cheering you on and where they made some special t-shirts for you with your name on them. And we baked some cupcakes and like, woo, like everybody loves you. Right. Mm -hmm. And you get on the, you know, you go down the path and everybody's loving on you. And then you get, get on the chemo train and you're, they treat you real good. And it's everything's state of the art and, and so nice and shiny and impressive. And the seats are all comfy and they bring you cookies and snacks and a diet Coke with your chemo. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, you're treated so well and everybody, you just feel so loved and cared for. Or, you take the alternate path, the holistic path, and you're on your own, man. Like you are hacking your way through the jungle alone in the dark and no one is there to support you. Like your support is gone. Like they're not coming with you. <laughs> and like that was also really difficult. I mean, I th again, I said this earlier, like the toughest part was like, coming to terms with the fact that like I had to do this alone. If I was going to do it, I had to do it alone and no one understood me and, and I had to be okay with it. But what I've learned now is that people who call you crazy, you know, when you accomplish that crazy thing, then they, all of a sudden now they think you're a genius, <laughs> you know? So like hang in there, right? If you've got big ambitions and big dreams and nobody understands them, like just hang in there. Like, if you accomplish those goals, like people will, their, their minds will change, right? Cause time changes things. And so even my wife who was really had a hard time with the decision I made, cause she was afraid I was going to die. Uh, she came around and then became, you know, my biggest ally and, and supporter. And, you know, a few months into the process, let me say this, when you get a cancer diagnosis, like it's a defining moment in your timeline. And you realize like everything you cared about, you don't care about anymore. Mm. Like, and there's an old adage, like the healthy person cares about everything. And the sick person only cares about one thing. That's getting well. I did a hard reset, right? It was a hard reset on my perspective on life and my priorities and what I cared about. And all of a sudden, all I care about is my, my family and getting well. And I had to live. And I realized like there's three people I have to live for. My wife, my mom, and my dad. Take us to the moment I think you were getting some kind of body work. Was it Reiki? And what did the healer ask you? Yep. Uh, the scariest question I've ever been asked, I think, which was, uh, yeah, I was getting some body work done. And this practitioner said, before we started, she was explaining, you know, what she was going to do it was like, it was Rolfing, like structural integration and, and, uh, it's just body tissue work, you know? And she said, um, before we start, I just need you to understand that I, I need to ask you something. And I said, what's that? And she said, do you want to live? And I was like, I mean, it was like a panic moment, you know? Because no one had asked me if I wanted to live, and I'd never even thought about it. Like, you just assume, well, of course you want to live, right? Everybody wants to live, don't they? But it was like it was almost like it was almost like time froze, and my life flashed before my eyes, and I had this epiphany that like maybe I don't want to live. Like maybe I've been self-destructive because I'm insecure and I, I hate myself and I don't like who I am and my, you know, and maybe all of that has led up to this moment and that's pretty scary. But I also realized I can choose to live. I can say yes, even if maybe up until this point, the answer was no. <laughs> and so... I said, yes, yeah, I want to live. And that's the question I ask every cancer patient now. Do you want to live? And then if they say yes, why? What do you have to live for? What is your purpose? If you're not sure, we got to figure it out. Like we need to get really clear. And so for me, my purpose was to live for those three people because I couldn't bear the thought of my wife and my mom and my dad putting me in the ground. 
Like that to me was so painful to think about the pain they would experience, right? Because I know I would, you know, if I was burying my child um, or my wife, like how painful that would be. So I was like, I got to live for these people. <laughs> and, uh, and that was my purpose. And so, and of course, there's other reasons I wanted to live. I was 26. Like, there, like I want to do stuff. Like, I felt like I was barely out of college and like I hadn't accomplished anything in my life. You know, it's like, I want to live a full life. And so I got very clear about what I wanted to live for. I had a strong will to live. And I call this the beat cancer mindset. It has multiple components, but the first component of the beat cancer mindset is that you have to believe that healing is possible. Number one, like you have to believe it's possible. If you don't believe healing is possible, I mean, you're, you're dead in the water, right? There's, there's no point in even trying. If you believe is he healing is possible, then you have to decide if you want to live and you have to get clear about what you want to live for, right? And this is just a logical progression of thought. And then once you're clear that you want to live, then you have to be willing to do whatever it takes to help yourself get well. You have to be willing to change your whole life. That's taking full responsibility for your situation and saying, hey, you know what? Maybe this is my fault. Maybe cancer is my fault. Can't say for sure. I'm not beating myself up. I'm not wallowing in self-pity, but I'm taking responsibility because whether or not I cause this problem, it's my problem. So being willing to change my whole life and do everything in my power to help myself get well was like the most empowering revelation, right? I got my power back. And what the cancer industry does, and not just the cancer industry, the medical industry does, is it victimizes patients. Every cancer patient wants to know why they got cancer, right? Right. They're all, how did I get cancer? Why did I get cancer? Why me? How did this happen? And if they ask the doctor, why do you think I got cancer? The answer they will get is, well, we don't know, but it might, it, you know, maybe it's hereditary. If you have a family history, it's genetic, you know, or it may just be bad luck. Mm -hmm. And those two answers, those are the only two answers they ever get, are what they do is they, they victimize the patient because what they're saying in so many words is it's nothing you did. Therefore, there's nothing you can do to help yourself. Your only hope is us, right? It's not, no, it wasn't your diet. No, it's not stress. No, it's not your lifestyle choices. It, no, it's not, you know, don't worry about any of that. What you just need to worry about now is just make sure that you show up for treatment and make your next appointment. And so patients are victimized. And then they go home, they, they have this false sense of empowerment. Well, my doctor said it wasn't my diet. So I don't have to change my diet. And then they, they get, I see this all the time, they get this weird sense of superiority, mm. like that they, that they know it all now because their doctor told them. And by the way, every patient thinks they have the best doctor. I don't know if you've noticed this. Mm. It's a point of pride. I have the best doctor. Patients love to brag about how great their doctor is. <laughs> And so they, they, and then there's this, this terribly dangerous mindset where they're totally a victim of their disease. They're powerless. They're, they refuse to help themselves because they, they believe that helping themselves won't help. And so this is the battle. I, I mean, this is my mission is trying to, to help cancer patients and really anybody who's interested in prevention understand that. Like your choices matter. Your choices led you to this moment that you're in and you can't blame other people. Like you have to blame yourself, right? For your successes and your failures. Like it's up to you. Your effort has produced fruit in your life. Is it good fruit or is it rotten fruit, right? But there's a harvest and sure, other people affect our lives, right? But we, we are the product of our decisions. And my, you know, the expression that I hijacked is, the, is this, the cliche, like everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. But what I like to say is everything happens for a reason. And most of the time, the reason is you. Yeah. <laughs> right. You have a really powerful line in the book. You say you're not 
sick because you have cancer. You have cancer because you're sick. That's right. Cancer is a manifestation of sickness, right? And that's why when they take a tumor out of somebody, tumors come back, right? Taking the tumor out in many cases did not solve the problem because cancer is a, is a head-to-toe systemic disease. And in order to, to heal, you've got to get your body out of this pro-cancer state, right? This state of inflammation and immunosuppression that allows cancer cells to thrive. And that's what the holistic health path is about. It's not, it's not about treating a symptom. It's about treating the underlying root causes of disease. And there are numerous. There's a lot. There's a lot of causes of cancer and there's a lot of causes of disease. And so the, the lazy patient, you know, right, the victimized patient will do no research. They will not read any books. They will not educate themselves. They will not try to learn what caused their problem. They will get put all their faith, hope, and trust in the doctor and absolve themselves of any responsibility for their life and their health and their future. And, you know, when you do that, that way, if it fails, it wasn't your fault. Sure. If you don't get well, it wasn't your fault. And you didn't fail. The treatment failed. These are things that I, you know, as I was trying to get well and trying to get my head around what my life and future were going to look like, you know, I was just ruminating on all these ideas, right? And and uh, the the big thing that I had to do is I had to figure out how to change my mind. Changing your diet's easy. Yeah. Like, and by the way, I mean, I talk about this in great detail in my book and I hope we have time to get into it here, but I mean, there's all these incredible anti-cancer compounds in fruits and vegetables, in plant food, right? All these wonderful nourishing vitamins, minerals, enzymes, antioxidants, anti-cancer molecules in food, like that you can flood your body with, and they help your body heal. They help you. They strengthen your immune system. They improve detoxification. They neutralize free radicals. They nourish your cells. Like there's this incredible cascade of benefits that you get when you decide to overdose, as I did, on nutrition. But that's easy, right? It's anybody can change their diet overnight. Anyone can, pretty much anyone, can start exercising overnight. And diet and exercise are the two biggest things you can do to promote health in your body. And anyone can do them immediately. <laughs> okay. The hard thing is the mental, emotional, and spiritual work. Yes. Right? And so that takes time. You can't change the way that you think overnight, right? You can have an, an epiphany, you can have a revelation, but you really have to work at changing the way you think about things. And so to speak more specifically, like I was, this is the kind of, this is the person I was, even though I was a Christian and I was a believer and I was a, a person of faith, like I was still insecure. I was prideful. I was uh, envious and jealous of other people. Like I couldn't be happy for someone else's success because of so much envy. Mm -hmm. um, I was negative and cynical and pessimistic. Uh, I was just swirling with negative emotion right? Negative thoughts and negative emotions. And I was very competitive. And, um, you know, I was in real estate and I was like buying properties and trying to build a business. And I was playing music and, and in a band and trying to show off on stage and be, you know, like trying and, you know, all these different aspects of my life to be like, be a person that was maybe bulletproof in a sense, you know, to elevate myself above the average person. All right. And it was all, you know, in some ways, I mean, every you know, who doesn't want to be successful and, and make money, right? Nobody wants to be broke. But, you know, I, I can evaluate my own motives and understand that I was desperately insecure and, and trying to, to compensate for my insecurity with achievements. And so when those thoughts would creep in, jealousy, bitterness, envy, I would have to catch myself and be like, I'm... I'm being jealous right now. I, I need to stop, right? When the fear and worry and anxiety would creep in about cancer, because I, I was not a worrier until I got cancer. Like I didn't, I was never afraid of anything. And now it's like every single day the fear is creeping in. Like it is trying to steal my joy every day. 
throughout the day. And the best times during your day when you have cancer are the times when you get busy and you forget. That's the best. You're working, you're with people you love, you're watching a movie or whatever, like, and you forget you have cancer. And it's just like the best. And then something reminds you and it's the worst. Yeah. You know, it's just this sinking, sick feeling, you know? And so, and here comes the wave of fear. And so I learned in those moments to quickly just not uh, bury it or suppress it, but just just to just like sit with the fear, acknowledge it, and just give it to God. Just say, God, I trust you. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm giving you my fear, right? I'm just trusting you. And that was a discipline, right? I had to discipline my mind. Like every time those thoughts would creep in, whether, like I said, it was envy or jealousy or being cynical or pessimistic or negative or fearful, like just constantly shifting my thoughts out of negativity into positivity. When I would start to feel down on myself and discouraged and frustrated, I could, I realized I could stop in that moment and go, okay, I've got a lot to be unhappy about. I mean, Mike, I was, I was resentful of any person who didn't have cancer. That's, that's how bad it was. Yeah. You know, like some person, it could be a total stranger you know, would walk past me and be like, in my mind, I'm like, look at that guy, you know, like, you know, just feeling animosity toward this person and sorry for myself. Like, why, why do I have cancer? You know, and this guy is just walking around, no problems, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's not healthy. Right. <laughs> and so I, I just quickly realized, you know, I, that's not healthy. I don't need to be doing that. I've got to get a hold of my thoughts take every thought captive. And so I realized I could do that by practicing gratitude. Yeah. And so in those moments of, again, negative thinking, I could stop and go, okay, wait a second. I've got a lot to be unhappy about. I've got cancer, right? I've got every right to be angry and bitter and sour and mean, right? Because who's going to say anything to me? Like, who's going to challenge me? I have cancer. Like, I'm going to be and say whatever I want. Right. Or I can stop and and count my blessings. Okay, what's good in my life? I know what's bad, right? I can name some bad stuff in my life, but let me stop and just shift my focus. What's good? I've got a wife who loves me. I've got a roof over my head. I have a car. Uh, I have air conditioning (laughs) in Memphis in the summer. (laughs) I've got pretty great dog. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got food in the fridge. I have enough money to pay my next set of bills. I, I'm blessed. And it doesn't take long of just counting your blessings for your attitude to just totally shift, man. Would you do that internally writing it down? How would you actually do that? It was more internal. Okay. Right. But I definitely, um, would write it down and I would talk about it openly too. I mean, it was every day. So every day, this was just a thought process where I had to go, okay, wait a second. Let's just count my blessings real quick, right? Because I don't want to go down this spiral of, you know, just negativity and unhappiness, Mm -hmm. bitterness, resentment, envy, jealousy. That became my, my, my gratitude hack, like my secret weapon to joy in my life was counting my blessings and thanking God for them, right? So acknowledging them and then just saying, thank you, God, like for all of these good things in my life. And I, despite the bad, and anyone can do this, right? Like every person listening or watching, like you've got bad stuff in your life that's frustrating, right? But you have a lot of good stuff too. You have so much more good stuff in your life. If you just stop and like really make a list, you know, take inventory of the good things in your life. And my, my ultimate gratitude hack, which I still use today you know, is anytime I get frustrated or feeling down or whatever, uh, I'll just stop and go, you know what? Right now there's someone dying in the hospital that would give anything to trade places with you. Right. They would love to have your problems. That was like the break glass of necessary. Yes. (laughs) That is the, that is the, and it works, man. Every time I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like, yep. Okay. This is not, anything worth being upset about, angry about, frustrated about, like my life is good. 
It's not problem free, but it's good. And thank you, God, that I'm not dying in the hospital today. I also remember you you just spoke about shifting from fear or cynicism to gratitude. But I also remember from your book, you you and I don't know if this was further on in the treatment, but actually planting seeds in a line that, that stood out to me was you said, I, I chose to think the way I wish to be. And I may be getting a few words off. And that that was really quite powerful. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just decided to see myself healthy, you know, to think of myself and see myself as healthy and well, and to speak that over my life, to say, I'm healthy, I'm healed, I'm well, right? Instead of like, I'm sick, right? I just started to project into the future and think about what do I want to become? Like, what am I working toward? Mm -hmm. And so I just set my focus on the future, which was health instead of on the present, which was, you know, maybe not so good, not so healthy in the moment. But later that evolved into this concept, which we talk about in our community is point your ship toward healthy island. Point your ship toward healthy island. And what that means is like every day, like you got to, you got to point the ship, right? You get up, you got to point the ship because look, life is Life is like being on the ocean, right? There's waves, there's storms, there's wind. You can get blown all over the place, right? Off course, you can get b- beat down mm-hmm. by a rough day. At the end of the day, you can you can always right the ship. Like you can, again, you got knocked off course. That's okay. Point it toward Healthy Island. Set your sights on where you need to go. You're not going to get there tomorrow, but you just keep course, right? Maintain the course. and uh, And that's what I did. Like every single day, day in, day out, overdosing on nutrition, juicing, raw foods, like working on my mindset, going deeper in my faith. And a big thing too was forgiveness. Mm. And again, this is part of that, the hard work, right? Again, the food to me, that was easy. The hard work is like really doing that soul searching and I kept reading these books written by cancer survivors or written by doctors that worked with cancer patients, holistic doctors and cancer experts. And this, you know, forgiveness, it just keep, kept coming up. And when, it, when I first read about it, I was like, nah, that's not for me. Like, I, that's not my problem. Like, I'm good. I don't, you know, I can't, I don't need to forgive anybody. Like, I'm, you know, I wasn't abused as a child. So, you know, I'm good. But, it, you know, the concept kept coming up. I kept running into it. And so finally I was like, you know, I don't want to leave any stone unturned. So maybe I need to give this some attention. And uh, so I just decided, okay, I, I'm because the, the message, by the way, is like that unforgiveness, that bitterness and resentment are root causes of disease. That every cancer patient has serious issues with resentment and bitterness in their life. And those are toxic emotions. And when you entertain those emotions, you have a physiological response. And that is immunosuppression, which is caused by adrenaline and cortisol being elevated. And so, which is what all stress does. Anytime you're in a state of stress, whether it's fear or worry or anxiety or or jealousy or envy or bitterness or anger, like prejudice, all those negative emotions produce stress, not just in your mind, but in your body. And your body responds with adrenaline and cortisol and those hormones suppress your immune system and promote inflammation. Well, immunosuppression and inflammation is the cancer body, right? That is a, an environment that's hospitable to cancer. And so, you know, I, I was like, okay, I, I, I should probably not mess around or take any chances here. So I'm going to forgive every person who's ever hurt me. Mm. And you can't just say that. You can't just be like, I forgive everybody, right? <laughs> it's <Yeah>. done. <laughs> like, like, that doesn't work. Right. <laughs> no, you have to do it by name, right? By instance, the, the method is simple. You sit quietly and you think through your life. And as you think about the people who've come and gone in your life, who've hurt you, you forgive them one by one. And so I made the decision and I, and I didn't do it in one sitting either. Right. It, I mean, it just, I just, but I would take 
specific time, like, you know, meditation time, prayer time, whatever, to be like, okay, who do I need to forgive? Like, let's think about my, let's think about it. You can do it chronologically, like think about, take yourself back to the playground and think about the mean kids, you know, that picked on you or, uh, you know, or friends or girlfriends or coworkers or family members, like, you know, all these people in your life that have, that have let you down, hurt your feelings, betrayed your trust, abused you. Like we all have people like that in our lives, you know, and all those injuries add up. Right. Every time someone hurts you, like they're, it, they hurt your heart. Like it's an injury to your heart. And we all know what it means to have a hard heart. You know, it's like someone that's really been through a rough life and been hurt by a lot of people and they become like hardened, right. And bitter and like a tumor, like a tumor. So I would just stop again. The, the method is simple. I would just say, look, okay, God, who do I need to forgive? Somebody pops up, right. Somebody comes to mind and I say, okay, <sighs> yep, I, you know, I, I remember this. I feel, I still feel the pain. I still feel the, I feel the injury. Uh, I feel the insult and um, I don't want to forgive them, but I'm choosing to forgive them and I'm letting it go and I'm giving it to you. They're all yours, right? I'm just, I'm not going to carry it anymore. They're all yours. And I'm asking you to bless them. Mm. That's the hardest part of the forgiveness prayer, right? And forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a choice. Did you notice I said, I don't want to forgive, yeah. right? That's, no, that's an appropriate feeling, right? But I chose to do it. Right? I'm making the choice to let it go. That's what forgiveness is. It's a choice. It's not a feeling. And then why bless them? Well, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so, man, I'm just trying to be like Jesus here. He gives good advice. Jesus Christ gives good advice, right? Put that on a poster. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. And what happens is, this is the beautiful thing. Like when you choose to bless your enemies, to pray for your enemies, to love your enemies. God heals your heart. That's how you get release from the prison of pain that you're in with unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and anger from the people in your past is you choose to forgive them and you ask God to bless them and you let it go. I'm telling you, man, this stuff, I mean, people get well just doing this because it's that powerful in your, your spirit, mind, body, soul, uh, all of it. Like, it is so powerful. We've just seen incredible transformations in people's lives just from forgiveness. And, um, and the, there's a couple other things about it. One is like, this is a decision for life. When you forgive someone, you're deciding this is it. This is I'm I'm forgiving them for this thing for life. They do a new thing, I'll forgive them for the new thing, right? <laughs> right? And some people, it's a constant process, right? They're just giving you lots of opportunities. Uh, and so, I, I like to say forgiveness is like a healthy diet. It only works if you stick with it. Mm. And then you want to be quick to forgive, right? Because people are going to continually hurt you. I, I have never been insulted more in my life than since I started, you know, becoming a cancer patient advocate, right. <laughs> right? So the last almost 14 years online, right? People are just mean. They're mean to me online. And uh, most of them aren't, right? But there's definitely some meanies, as you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so I've just learned, like, to be quick to forgive and just say, God, like, wow, that was mean, right? That comment was... A, a deliberate attack, uh, but God bless him and uh, I forgive him and I'm not going to let that steal my joy, right? Just I'm just letting it go. And forgiveness, giving your fear to God, practicing gratitude, catching yourself thinking neg negatively and choosing to think positively, like these are all things like that just take time, but they're so worthwhile, Right? These are all practices. And the more you do it, the better you get. I like to say like, you have to exercise your forgiveness muscle. Right, You exercise that muscle and you just get really good at it. So good. 
right? Yeah. It just becomes second nature, you know, and then things just bounce off of you. You're like at this point, I've heard every insult possible, right? I've been around long enough. Like no one surprises me with their, you know, whatever they can think of. I'm you like, think oh, yeah. I can think of a new one. Please try. I'm a Let's pretty see. good writer, man. <laughs> like, you never know. Let's I see what you got. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me show you how good I am at forgiving. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're talking about holistic health, yeah. right? Like all of these things matter, not just the food. And I think the big misconception is people think, oh, you're just trying to tell people they can cure cancer with broccoli or something. It's like, no, there's no miracle cure, magic bullet, lotion or potion that's going to cure your cancer but cancer can be healed. People are healing. I've interviewed dozens and dozens of people who've healed cancer against the odds, all types and stages on the Chris Beat Cancer podcast on my website and YouTube and all over. And so like, if you really want to learn how to be successful, you need to study successful people. Right. Period. Period. And there are so many people now and it's the numbers are just growing and growing who have overcome cancer, heart disease, MS, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, all of these chronic Western diseases by changing their diet and their lifestyle, right? And their habits and their thoughts, right? By taking this holistic approach to health. So it's like, it's really exciting. Like, what happened to your cancer as you did all these projects? Yeah, well, so they took the tumor out, right? But I was really high risk of recurrence. And so what I did was obviously I took, adopted this radical life change mm -hmm. approach. I found a naturopathic doctor. I found an integrative oncologist. We monitor my blood work every month. We did CT scans every six months. Like we were just paying really close attention. Like what's happening in his body? Is he getting better? Is he getting worse? And so over time it was just better, 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 like good report, good report, good report. And then five years, no cancer. Right. And it was like, man. And my onco uh, oncologist was like, you're out of the woods. And about a year and a half after that is when I started the Chris Beat Cancer website. You know, I was like, I didn't want to talk about cancer. I wanted to get so far away from cancer. Sure. You know, I was like, it was horrible. Like it, it, it was a horrible experience, like life changing in a lot of good ways, but it's so, it was so scary, you know? And uh, I didn't want to relive that. I wanted to just continue with real estate and playing music and move on with my life. But I just felt this nagging in my spirit that like, you've got to share your story. You know, there are people that need hope and encouragement and you just need to put your story out there. Yeah. And so, yeah, I started writing articles about my experience and making videos and talking about nutrition and juicing and raw food and, you know, health. And then you know, it just kind of grew. It was like 2010, man. But I don't know, social media and YouTube and everything was just like popping. And my audience grew uh, pretty quickly and and people were reaching out, asking for help. And I was able to work with people one-on-one -on -one and coach them and counsel them and be their advocates. And and then other survivors were coming to me saying, oh, I did the same thing. This is amazing. Like I healed my leukemia. I healed my lymphoma. I healed my brain tumor, you know, like say, doing the same things you did. And I'm like, uh, can I interview you? Mm -hmm. This is great. Like, Mm -hmm. People need to know, like, they don't need to just believe me. They need to see that other people have, have done this too. They need to understand, like, I'm not a fluke or lucky or, you know, whatever. Like, so, yeah, it's like, here we are 14 years later, and it's like the movement is just growing and growing, and people yeah. are really becoming encouraged and empowered and seeing the value in, in radical life change, and then also understanding, like, what's causing cancer. Yes. Because you have to identify the causes, eliminate them from your life, and replace those things with health promoters. Like, that is the process. And so it's easier said than done, but it's really not that difficult to do if you set your mind to it. Yeah. After reading your book, I felt uh, my conception of cancer had completely shifted, where before it was this nebulous kind of, like, ghost that just descends upon someone or someone you love and you just get it. And after reading your book, it's like, no, like we know a lot of ways that cancer happens. And yeah. if you avoid these toxic things, these toxic foods, these toxic thoughts, you're not going to get cancer. Like, it doesn't just happen. And I found that really powerful. I have a question for you. Since you got out of the woods, 
you made these radical changes when you're in the woods. Have you ever gotten sloppy since you got out of the woods? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. And then I find that with myself, I'll go through, I've never had cancer, but some sort of emotional heartbreak or what have you. And I go, okay, I'm going to make this big change and I do it. And then when things start going really well, you get a little sloppy sometimes. It's, yeah, it's easy to backslide, right? It's so easy. And there was definitely a period of time where, like, I was a couple years post-cancer, but I hadn't started, like, my website or sharing my story. But there was definitely a period of time there where I was kind of, like, sliding back into my old habits. You know, I was busy. I was, like, going through fast food lines. I was, you know, at Home Depot, you know, at the checkout buying M&Ms, you know, you know, just like doing stuff that I knew was not good, mm-hmm. right? These are not good things for my, my body and my health, but I was like slipping back into that routine. And it's funny, once I started the Chris Beat Cancer, you know, website and, and sharing my story, it actually helped to keep me accountable. Yeah, so I'm like, sure. I got to walk the walk here, right? Like, and so, yeah, that, that actually helped a lot, but it doesn't mean that I've never had an M&M. Right. <laughs> You know, but, uh, but yeah, it's like, what's so important is like, it's what you're doing 98% of the time that matters. Right. Yeah. Like, and so you don't have to be a perfectionist. You don't have to be a raw foodist. Right. I mean, a plant-based diet is so incredible, raw and cooked, like in terms of the anti-cancer value of this food that God made for us. It's so wonderful. And so broccoli just, sprouts. Broccoli sprouts are amazing. Like the and so and I want to touch on this because you just brought it up for a second uh, a second ago. And I'm so glad you did. We know what's causing cancer. Here are the big causes. The number one cause of cancer is smoking. Still, still the number one cause. When I walked out of the airport to wait for my ride, who shall remain nameless? <laughs> To get a straight jacket over it's, there. It's Doug Evans. It's the Sprout guy. He, he's on the couch with his. It's the first his time arms. that he has been silent for an over. He's an on hour. the couch with his arms tucked into his shirt because I guess he's cold. Sweet Doug. But I but I walked outside from the airport. I sat down on the bench, and the guy next to me is smoking a cigarette. Yeah, man. Another guy walks out, lights up a cigarette, and then I look to my left, and there's a lady next to me fiddling with a vape. And I'm like, what in the world? So I got up and went back inside. But cigarettes are the number one cause, okay? Second leading cause of cancer. Now, you've read my book, so you might know, but let's try to see if you can guess. Do you remember what the second leading cause of cancer is? And most people do not guess this correctly. I don't, I don't remember what the second leading one. I remember the one that stuck out to me the most because maybe it was the most surprising, but uh, deodorants, I remember. Deodorants have a lot of toxic ingredients, aluminum being the the, the real baddie. Yeah. Um, but also but I'm endocrine disruptors. Okay. But yeah, no, the second leading cause is obesity. Mm. Obesity. And right now, you know, we're in this weird time in our culture where you're sort of like considered to be, let's just say, a a, not a nice person if you talk about obesity being a bad thing. Right. And uh, it's- It is a bad thing. It's a bad thing for your health. And look, this isn't about beauty standards, right? If you think uh, obesity is beautiful, I don't care. Great. Like you you think, you you know, it's uh, it's beautiful and attractive. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. That's not what this conversation is about. What this conversation is about is the fact that obesity is the second leading cause of cancer. And the reason it's the second leading cause is because when you're overweight or obese, it is a burden on the entire system, on your body. And those excess fat cells produce inflammatory molecules that suppress your immune system and promote inflammation. And that's also why uh, people who are obese are more likely, uh, were more likely to get uh, life-threatening COVID infections, sure. hospitalization, and death, right? Why was that? Because they have a suppressed immune function as a result of their metabolic state. So, you know, n- uh, not shaming anybody, um, but if you want to get yourself out of the high-risk zone for cancer, right? If you want to take steps to reduce your risk, please do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not doing me any favors, but trust me, you don't want to have cancer. It's not fun. 
stop smoking, get down to a healthy body weight. When you eat a plant-based diet, I mean, you lose weight effortlessly. It's easy to get to a healthy body weight when you eat fruits and vegetables, especially when you eat a lot of raw food. Exercise, again, the simple things. And then the, the other big leading cause is alcohol. Mm. Alcohol is a major cause and it's, a you know, everybody drinks alcohol. So many, I mean, I think. No, they don't. Yeah. Not everybody in this room. Yeah. I don't know if anyone does in no, this room. <laughs> yeah, maybe not in this room, but I know you know a lot of people who drink the alcohol. Yeah. Uh, who imbibe. But yeah, alcohol is a major cause of cancer. Major cause. There are eight different cancers linked to alcohol consumption. And I know that's a bummer for a lot of people because everybody likes beer and wine and mixed drinks and all that kind of stuff and champagne, you know, but um, there are things you can do to reduce your risk. And I don't think you can ever be cancer proof, but you can put yourself in the lowest risk category with just some simple diet and lifestyle shifts, right? From eating a whole food plant-based diet to exercising daily to cutting out the bad habits, alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceuticals, right? Dr all drugs, really. But uh, people tend to think, you know, they tend to th give pharmaceuticals a pass because, well, my doctor prescribed them. Mm. So how can that be bad? But if you watch the drug commercials, you'll see at the end of so many drug commercials, you'll s listen to the disclaimer Listen to what they're saying very quickly in a low monotone voice while they're showing you images of, you know, two people on a bicycle built for two, you know, right. or, or like in a canoe, right? A rowboat. You might die. Yeah. They're going to say, <laughs> may increase the risk of certain types of cancer. You've heard that so many times on so many drug commercials. Mm. And you will continue to hear it because there's a lot of pharmaceuticals that increase cancer risk, heart disease risk, diabetes risk, like all kinds of problems in the body. So like you just have to be aware, like drugs alleviate symptoms, but they more often than not, if you're taking a drug for a chronic condition, it's going to cause more problems and more chronic disease in your life over time. Chris, do you believe God gave you cancer? Oh, we're going deep. I'm curious to know how you frame that now. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I'm not going to say he didn't. I'm not going to say he did because I don't know. There's a story in the Bible. You know the story of Job? My favorite. Okay, the book of Job. What? That and Ecclesiastes yeah. are my faves in the is, Old Testament. Ecclesiastes is a good philosophy book. But the story of Job is he was a very rich man, very wealthy had a lot of children, had big flocks and, and, and a big, he had, a, he had a fight at the empire and he was a righteous man. He was a good man. He was a good man. And, uh, and he was highly regarded, you know, by everyone around. And as the, the story goes is that basically God gave Satan permission to afflict Job, to, uh, destroy his wealth, destroy his family, uh, and his health. He, he, he Basically, God gave Satan permission to do all those things, except he could not take Job's life. Mm. And it was a, to test Job, to prove his faith, because God knew that Job was had, had such a strong faith that even going through this incredible calamity, he would not deny God. He would not blame God. He would not curse God. And so, you know, there's an example of, well... God allowed it, right? He gave Satan permission to do it. So who's to say, right? If that was what happened in my life, maybe. But um, I think a lot of things that happen in life too are, are not necessarily like, oh, God caused this in your life. They happen because God gave us free will, right? And so, like I said earlier, like we make choices and those choices have consequences, and the consequences may be good or they may be bad. And so like a person that smokes for 30 years and gets lung cancer, did God give them the cancer? Or was it a result of their bad habit? Yeah. Cancer causing habit. So, I, you know, I, I've thought about it enough to, to be comfortable not knowing. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, like, I, I, I will say I definitely was frustrated and my faith was shaken when I was diagnosed, 
because you know, I have this why me? Like, why do I have cancer? I'm trying to be a good guy. Mm. I'm not out swindling people and like stealing and raping, right? Like, why am I the guy with the cancer? Like, it felt really unfair. Mm. And so that that was hard. And I, I mean, I, you know, like I wrestled with God in prayer about it because it was, I was angry and frustrated and I felt it just felt unfair, right? It felt unfair. But at the end of the day, I just sort of submitted and just said, you know what, whatever the reason, I'm going to just sit, humble myself and ask for help, ask for direction, ask for healing. And in my prayer life, I would just often pray, and I still pray this way, is like, God, just show me what I need to do and show me what I need to change. Show me what I need to change in my life. And so he did. I changed everything. <laughs> and you listened. It was, I listened and yeah. I obeyed, right? I did. I yeah. like, that's I the changed big thing, everything. though, because, you know, often myself, I don't have a problem usually hearing what God is telling me to do, but sometimes I have a little issue listening, you know, and so I want to honor and human acknowledge nature. you for listening. And well, I was desperate too. So you were desperate. I appreciate that. But, but <laughs> also in your in your story, what I hear is when you talk about the four lane highway, the reason that highway is attractive to so many people is because they get showered, as you mentioned, with sympathy. And sympathy it looks a lot like love, but it's not love. And if one's life is set up where there isn't love. That sympathy is very attractive. Yeah. And what you did is you made a decision to forego the sympathy. In fact, I'm actually going to make a decision where the people I love the most are calling me crazy, are worried about me, and I'm alone. And that's faith. That's faith. And so whether God gave you your cancer or, or not, we don't know. What I do know is that you use that situation to become a better version of yourself and to positively impact many, many other people, so much so that your cancer looks darn close from my perspective to a gift. And I thank you for that. Yeah. And I just want to say to everyone listening that Everything Chris has talked about today and everything he's written about, you should still go read his book, is 100% applicable to every human. And I read your book and I made so many changes in my life. And I made that forgiveness list. And as you, as you, as you revisit, I'm like, I need to maybe revisit that. I got, got, got a couple more names on there again. And... It's like you don't have to wait for the wheels to come off to live a beautiful life. And it's never too late and you can heal yourself from anything. And just like that book was that hope for you that someone sent you from Alaska, you, you've written a book that is, a, that is hope for so many others and, you, and your, your podcast and your, just all the work you do is, is so beautiful. Well, I had to carry the torch, you know. It's like, yeah, it's you like, are a torch carrier. Had to carry it. I, I just just trying to be a light in the dark, right? It's cancer is a dark place and there's a lot of fear and hopelessness and, uh, you know, j yeah, just trying to be a light in the dark. And it's funny, like full circle. I mean, and the question you asked was so good, whether God gave me cancer or not, but there's this verse in Romans about Romans eight twenty eight. We know it says that God works all things for the good of those who love him mm. and are called according to his purpose. So like, that was the first verse that came to my mind after my diagnosis. The very first one, God works all things for the good of those who love him. And that's pretty challenging, right? All things, right? All things. Well, what is, what is Paul talking about? The bad things. Yeah. Right? He's not talking about the good things. They're already good, <laughs> right? He works the bad things in your life for your good. And so that gave me, 
it was a challenge to my faith because I'm like, okay, this is a promise. Do I believe it? Yes, I'm choosing to believe this because that's what faith is, choosing to believe. I'm choosing to believe that God is going to work this for my good. I don't like it. Like I would I wish I could get out of this cancer situation immediately, right? But I'm just going to trust that he's going to work it for my good. And so I hung on to that verse, man. Like I just clung to it that he's going to work it for my good. And he has. Like he he did. Yeah, you know? big time. He did work it for my big good. And, and he's allowed me to encourage and give hope and and practical, you know, applicable action steps to, you know, to my community. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll never know this side of heaven, how many people I've been able to reach, you know, right. you just don't know. And <laughs> there's some no real idea. grace as well in, in the, you helping others helps you stay accountable, you know, and, and that's something I think that the, the good folks at AA have really stumbled upon as well. And, and I think the reason both of us are in the, these chairs right now. And so it's another like really deep lesson. You know, if you really want to like stay on the path, help others on their journey and, and it, it alivens you in a, a new way. There's some real grace there, Chris. Yeah. And it gives you purpose. Mm -hmm. And by the way, nothing feels better than helping someone who wants your help. Right. I mean, yeah. nothing feels better. It's the most fulfilling, I think, human experience is like genuinely helping someone that that wants and receives your help. Yeah. So like I'm addicted to it. I'm not stopping. Good addiction. I'm gonna ask you two uh two quick ones. Yeah. And then we're gonna help some people hopefully live. So the first is who's someone you wouldn't be here without? I wouldn't be here without without my wife, for sure. You know, she, like I said earlier, we had a rough, we had a rough time in the beginning of my diagnosis because she was afraid I was making a, a you know, the wrong decision with my treatment. But she came around and became a huge advocate. And let me just tell you a story about how amazing she is as a person. Cancer made me acutely aware of my own mortality. Right. I realized like I have a finite amount of time to live. And with cancer, I don't even, is it five years, 10 years? I don't even know. Mm -hmm. And so I said this earlier and I almost, I didn't, I didn't even close the loop on this. So now's the opportunity. I wanted to be a dad. Like that was one of the things that I wanted out of life. Like I wanted to be a dad. And so I talked to my wife about it. Like, what do you think about? trying to have kids, starting a family. And she, she said, yes. I mean, she loved me so much that she was willing to start a family with me, not knowing if I would be alive to help raise a child. And she got pregnant like right away. And so, uh, you know, a year after my diagnosis, I was back in the hospital holding a beautiful baby girl <laughs> one year later, man. And it was like, now I got four people to live for. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you do. And then three years later, we had a, I had a fifth person, another daughter. So yeah, she, she's been my, my rock and just we're, we've been married for 22 years and uh, yeah, I just, uh, she's awesome. If God was whispering something to you, right now for you to remember what would it be i guess i'm going to go with gratitude you know because that everyday practice of thanking god remember to thank god for the good things in your life right for the blessings in your life like there's you know verse in the bible enter his gates with thanksgiving right it's like the first thing you should be doing every day is thanking god for another day of life and health you know, and, and I do. It's like one of the first things I do when I wake up. I'm like, thank you, God, for another day. Thank you for being here. What a blessing. My primary question is, uh, there are so many different types of cancers affecting our service members. What are some of the health habits that you noticed that changed the game for you when you were in your war with cancer? The big thing was the raw food diet. 
right? I mean, it's a it's such a major shift, nutritional shift away from eating the standard American diet, which is you know tons of meat and dairy and processed food and junk food and sugary drinks and you know caffeine and all this all these stimulants. So that is a huge lever, right? In terms of like levers that you can pull to help yourself, right? If you think about it, there's big levers and then there's like small levers and there's like little switches. <laughs> the big levers is raw food diet or even just a whole food plant-based diet and exercising every day. I mean, they really are. And, and I know it sounds like too good to be true or too easy, but these are really things that most people aren't doing. Like they're, like they're not doing those things. And when they do, in our community, we just see incredible turnarounds in people's health and 90 days of consistent effort where they're just 100% committed and dedicated to, to changing their life. And those are the two big first steps, right? And then, you know, of course, then they'll we encourage them to work through the, your mindset and forgiveness and all that other good stuff too. For sure. I feel like practicing mindfulness amongst, uh, you know, not neglecting both your spiritual and physical health are both integral parts of any type of healing. But most people feel that a hand in hand is that in order to seek and receive treatment, it must be through traditional routes. And I see, you know, of course, more and more outbreak of the alternative spiritual, physical and psychological ways to heal yourself from all different types of ailments. Thank you guys so much for your time. Seriously. You got it. Are you a veteran or, do you, or is a loved one a veteran? Um, I was in the Army for three and a half years, sort of like a basic service. I, I more or less say my um, my time in the Army was a observatory one. Um, I was partially in a special forces battalion and then partially in an infantry battalion. And that sort of allowed me to see how on both sides of the spectrum from having money to train and being able to come into work with a positive attitude all the way down to, you know, the not so... Um, positive side of being in the military that on both sides that um, people both physically and spiritually were having sort of the same problem um, which is why where my main concern comes from is my I, I myself am trying to tackle the alternative forms of psychological rehabilitation for veterans suffering from anxiety depression and PTSD yeah Beautiful. that's really good that's really good well and you know something something you said that I just want to touch on a little bit more is that um, you know there's a lot of there's certainly a lot of things that medicine can do. Uh, to help people. But we're seeing a huge shift, as you said, because there's a lot of things that medicine fails at, right? And it typically is with chronic disease. Modern medicine uh, is good at treating chronic disease, but not solving the disease, not curing the disease, not healing the disease. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a huge shift in, um, in our world and people like yourself and, and me and Mike of just saying like, Hey, th they're not solving the problem. Like let's look elsewhere. Let's look for solutions elsewhere. So it's encouraging. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for your service and your question, brother. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Mike, Thank Chris, you. for having me on and uh, God bless you both. God bless you. God bless you. There's only so much I can share. Um, okay. But I will say that the last five years, um, from a life's perspective, I've had cancer for sure. Um, medically, I'm fine. I've been into Ironmans and marathons, and I've done a lot of things to keep myself and my brain and my, my um, faith in God very healthy. Um, but at the same time, what I've experienced is I would say it's equivalent or, or to cancer. It's been so, so challenging. Um, but during that time, I've, I got married two years ago. Um, between us both, we have seven children and I found a lot of joy along the way. Um, and sorry to be vague. I, I mean, I'd talk with you guys offline. I, yeah, I no really problem, just don't, of course. I don't want to yeah. put anything out there that, that would embarrass <laughs> my of family. Course, of course. Yeah. Thank but, you for uh, honoring that. I will say this. Um, it's been extremely challenging and um, yeah, my faith, Chris, like, or, you know, what you were talking about with your faith and your attitude and your mindset, that was very powerful for me to listen to. I, that resonated really well. That's kind of what's kept me healthy. Um, but I want to hear more about your story. Um, I, again, I'd, I'd talk to you guys offline and tell you my whole story, but it's, it's, it's five years long. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, it's, it's okay. I think, 
you know, we all go through adversity in life, right? Adversity is part of life. And we all have different journeys that are difficult. But for me, like, I think putting your faith in, in the fact that God is going to lead you through it, right? And not dwelling on the difficult circumstance. And just whenever you start to feel bogged down and depressed and discouraged about difficulty, like you, you have to kind of slap yourself around a little bit and be like, you know what? Like, I'm not going to let this steal my joy. Like, that's what I tell myself. Like, I'm not going to let this steal my joy. God is going to carry me through this. He's going to see me through the wilderness, right? You know the story of the Israelites. If you're a person of faith, right? They left Egypt. They went in the wilderness. And they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah. Okay. Just got manna. (laughs) 40 years. And they were there. They weren't supposed to be there 40 years. They actually wandered around in circles because of their unbelief and faith and grumbling and complaining. It ain't that far. Egypt to Israel. Yeah, it's not that far. It's like it was like a couple of pretty quick. It's a couple yeah, it was supposed like a couple months journey on foot. Yes, right? for sure. And and they ended up wandering around the wilderness for 40 years because they did not follow God. They didn't trust God. They grumbled and complained and uh instead of just trusting him to lead them through. And that's that's like, you know, that's a lesson for us, right? Is that in the middle of uh, difficulty, our attitude toward the difficulty and toward God really can prolong the difficulty. And I'm not saying you've prolonged your own difficulty. I have no idea. What we know our response needs to be when we're in the hard times is, is saying, God, I'm trusting you to get me through this. I'm not going to, you know, just show me what I need to do. Show me what I need to change. Lead me, right? Lead me through this. And then in terms of the joy, it's like, look, there's there's some things in life there's no joy in them, right? <laughs> like there's no, you, you, you just kind of look around and be like, there's no joy here, but where is my joy in my children, right? They're a huge source of joy for you. The new marriage, I'm sure is a source of joy. And so like, you just got to shift your focus toward where you know the joy and happiness and fulfillment and contentment comes from because that fills you back up, right? From the other stuff that's draining you so, yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious when you were in the, when you were in those depths of, when you had people telling you, you, you might not live, you know, what type of things did you do on the day to day to find the simple joys in life? I'm just curious what you did. I have my things that I do. Yeah. I'm curious what yours are. You know, life was so precious to me. Like it just became so precious that it was just easy for me to savor the good times, you know, like it was just all of a sudden I was so appreciative and, and it's like, I didn't have a special technique. It was just, I was so appreciative and thankful of the good things in my life because I had this huge overwhelming bad, you know, that it just made the darkness made the, the, the lights that much shine lighter. brighter, you know? Cause, and so, um, I, I know it sounds like kind of vague and not, maybe not a no, great no. answer. No, it's a great answer. Actually. But just like, you know, having just spending time with my wife, right? Just being together with my wife with a person who loved me or, or making my juice or like, you know, like I had, <laughs> I had this, it was funny. I would have these moments of just bliss where I was, I was so acutely aware that there was, I could be in the hospital, you know, after being in the hospital and getting out, like even just being in the hospital for a week and in a bed, being able to walk mm-hmm. after not walking for a week mm-hmm. was so, man, it was such an incredible feeling. Like I had taken walking for granted. Yep. Right. And then I had to recover from this abdominal surgery. And when I could finally go for a run for the first time, like it was, it was so exhilarating. I was in horrible shape. I could barely run, but it was like, (laughs) you know, and so I don't know. I, I, I just was so sensitized, right? I was so sensitized to the good things in life that, I, I just stopped taking them for granted, you know, and I just would just be like, this is so good. I'm just going to like 
savor this moment and this time, like obviously we had a little girl and then it was like all that baby stuff. And, you know, so yeah. And I, I don't know. I just started to really appreciate the things that I didn't before, even just working, you know, just doing my work or, but, you know, I was playing music and working on songs and like all the stuff that I liked doing before all of a sudden I loved and I just got, I extracted more joy out of it. <laughs> I hope that helps. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. And I'll just add, uh, cause I, just on top of that, cause all that is gold in these areas of life that Chris mentioned where there, there is no joy, where there's no joy, there's an opportunity for future pride. Absolutely. So in the areas, Victor Frankl says this, right? In the areas where we can't change the circumstances, there's no joy. We can't change what the circumstances are calling for us to change. And so you can have an attitude and a disposition and deal with your adversity, whatever it is. We don't know what it is, but I can tell it's deep. You can deal with it in such a way with a dignity that in a year, two years, five years, ain't no joy, but there's pride. And no one can take that from you. No one can take that from you. I get it. And that's kind of how the journey has been for me over the last five years. In the beginning, it was like, this is never going to get better. And now fast forward five years, like I said, I've got a beautiful angel that I'm married to, um, you know, and combined with a beautiful family and, uh, things are very, very different now. Um, but like I said, since my early days as a 19 year old kid walking the streets in Columbia, I was always interested to see people that have crappy circumstances, just garbage circumstances that they can't change and they can be joyous. And I'm sitting here in this beautiful big house and I I got some first, I got some problems. They're real for sure. But the thankfulness, the gratitude, the stuff you guys been talking about has resonated very deeply. It's been really powerful. Thanks for letting me have you on the show. I'd I'd love to sit here and keep chatting, but thank you. (laughs) Let's do it right now. I want you to close your eyes. And take a deep breath in, let it go. Take another deep breath in, let it go. And one last one, fill all the way up. (laughs) Fill it up, let it go. And I want you to just bring to mind, just like Chris said, one thing you're grateful for. Keep your eyes closed. No, stay in it. Take this serious. It'll work. Bring to mind. You don't have to say it. Bring to mind something that brings you joy. It could be a memory. It could be a human being. It could be a pet. And let the thought of that source of joy grow out of your heart. Let it, let it live inside you. It's yours. I want you to take another big breath in. Let it go. Another one. Let it go. One more. Fill it all the way up. Let it go. And now I want you to think of another source of joy in your life. Like I asked Chris, another human you wouldn't be here without. And let the joy, the smile live inside your heart. Let it live on your face. And I take, want you to take another deep breath in. Feel it all the way up. A warrior breath. Let it go. 
Another deep breath. Let it go. One last full breath in. And this time when you let it go, let a noise out. Ah! Ah! (laughs) Keep your eyes closed. And you got your first two sources of joy in your heart. They're there. I'm going to bring one more in. We could go all day because you got so much joy in your life. (laughs) But we're just going to do three right now. So I want you to think of one more thing you're grateful for. One more thing you love. Could be someone really close to you right now or maybe just a, a stranger that made a difference for you. But something that puts a smile on your face. You could think of one of those. (laughs) I got plenty. (laughs) And now you got these three in your heart. And really let the feeling take over, take in the the good. Now open your eyes. Thanks, guys. How was that? It was great. Did you feel some joy? Absolutely, I did. Absolutely. Okay. Well, you don't need me or Chris to do that. 100%. All you need is your breath in your own head. All right? Amen. Yeah. God Thank bless you. you, man. You're such a, I always just want to reflect, you're such a beautiful soul. You know, your Thanks. energy, and I, I can tell how much you care about your loved ones and, and, and about being the best version of yourself. So, Absolutely. If Thanks, you look guys. back at who you it. were, like when you're 19 to who you are now, you're someone, <laughs> I said this last week when we did a podcast, but you're someone that someone decided to spend the rest of their life with. You're someone that uh, decided they wanted to bring new life into the world with. You're someone that decided they trusted you with, with their children. So you got, some, you got some good things going for you. So Huge. Yeah, huge. Huge. I you. love you, man. I'm a blessed man. Thank you. God bless you. You guys are great. Keep singing, man. Yes, sir. Okay. Keep singing about pills and Ibiza, please. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I saw I say, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm the I took a pillin' guy, but even more beautiful with no pill inside. Can you feel the vibe? <laughs> <laughs> there it is, man. Peace, beautiful. buddy. Take care. See ya. My question for you, and I think you've kind of already answered it, but either way, my question was, what strategies do you use to stay consistent in your healthy lifestyle? And then number two, what do you do? What strategies do you use when you fall off? Like how do you get back on track? I think you answered that one a little bit, but really strategies to stay consistent and then getting back on track. Well, practically, you know, like with food, if you buy it, you're going to eat it. And that includes junk food, right? So like for me with cancer and even now, it's like, I don't want food in the house that I'm tempted to eat, (laughs) right? And so um, it, it, it may sound overly simplified, but it's like when you go to the grocery store and you pick out food and you choose healthy food and you bring it home, you're going to eat it. And so having healthy food at home is like, Step number one for eating healthy, right? Um, Exercise is huge, as we've talked about. And for me, like, I have to block it off in the calendar, right? In Google Calendar, there's every day, there's an hour blocked off. Like, that's when I exercise. It's non-negotiable. It's it's blocked off. And and there are some days it doesn't happen for for reasons, but... uh, five to six days a week, I'm doing it. I'm exercising. So again, it's, it's not, it's not that hard. You just have to, you just have to decide this is a priority. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure it's a priority. I need to rearrange my life. And the cool thing is, is like, you know, once you get a little momentum going, it's, it's easy to keep it up. It's just that first initial effort, right? Getting over the hump, getting the new routine, eating better, right? Consistently going to the gym or consistently going for a run or whatever the exercise is, the Zumba classes, you know, whatever. Uh, But it just doesn't take long, a few weeks of consistency. And then all of a sudden, like, you just start to feel better and you get get in a groove. 
And so anyway, that's the, the kind of getting started part. And then, mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, everybody, everybody slips up and falls off the wagon or maybe has a, you know, a cheat meal, which I would never call it a cheat meal because that's, it's just cheating is who wants to be a cheater. Yeah. Right. It's like, <laughs> What I, I, I came up with a ter- with terminology, I call it recreational food. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what it is. Okay. <laughs> you know, recreational food, like don't call it a cheat meal because that makes you a cheater and you're not a cheater um, or a cheat day or whatever. Just like, don't, don't do that. But, um, but you know, the thing is you can feel good and actually enjoy those kind of recreational foods when you know that you've already arranged your life and you're in, and, and you're eating 98% super healthy, mm-hmm. then it doesn't matter. You know, it really doesn't. The the slice of cheesecake at dinner with somebody, like it, it doesn't matter. It's not enough to hurt you, right? The, that's not what's putting people in the cancer clinic, right? It's the fact that they're eating meat and dairy, processed food, fast food, junk food, sugar, salt, and oils, three meals a day, every day. So, um, like I said earlier, it's like, don't focus on perfection. Just focus on like, what can I, how can I really eat super healthy without, uh, you know, without guilt and without, um, you know, feeling like it's an impossible task or, uh, setting yourself up to a, to a, a standard that's impossible to achieve. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the reason I ask is because many years ago in 2014 or so, I actually became vegan, went the whole raw food diet. And then over the years, I've transitioned back and forth to where I am now. And I've made some other changes recently. I stopped drinking. I stopped doing a bunch of stuff. But uh, Great. yeah, I, it's Love very it. exciting. So I feel like I've, I've gotten that you know, gotten that accomplishment under my belt. And now I'm wanting to get back into where I was before, but it can be scary because you don't want to fail. And because when you fail, you start losing trust in yourself. And so that's, that's the reason for my question. So why don't you think about it this way? There's no failure. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's no failure. This is just personal experimentation, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a pass or fail game. It's just you deciding, okay, what do I want to try next? Like, mm-hmm. do I, why don't I try raw food for a month and see how I feel and see how I do? Instead of like putting a, a raw foodist flag in your front yard. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, or getting. I always do that, by the way. People go, are you vegan? I said, no, I eat, yeah. I eat I'm eating vegan. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not vegan. Right. I, I, I am also vegan. not vegan. I don't identify as a vegan. But, uh, but yeah, you like, don't go get a vegan tattoo. Like you're really setting yourself up for failure. Okay. <laughs> Just saying, I know some people with vegan tattoos that eat cheeseburgers now. So, yeah, I didn't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. But so, so yeah, don't be, don't be afraid to fail and don't even look at it as failure. But all you're doing is, is again, personal experimentation and trying things to see if they help you and make you feel better. Right. And obviously you have a sense that they will. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and then don't beat yourself up because you, because you g- kind of got away from a previously healthier lifestyle. It's fine. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's totally fine. Like no guilt, no shame. It's, it, you know, you're just on a, we're all on this learning path and, uh, path of discovery. And, um, I think it's great. Yeah. I think it's great. It, it, like, you know, just pick, pick something that you want to change. Mm-hmm. Right one thing and then change it and work on it and see how you feel and see how you do. And, you know, and then if, if, if you get that kind of locked in and you're Mm -hmm. like, Oh, this is good. Like I really feel good. Like our friend Doug Evans is predominantly just eats sprouts. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Like he's a, he's a massive sprout eater, raw food eater. And he just feels, and he and I were talking about this. He just feels so good doing it. It's like for him, it never seemed like, he felt like he couldn't stop or he'd be failing. It just seemed to me based on our conversations that he just really realized for himself, like he just feels so good eating that way. He just knows he just needs to eat that way. It's just how he feels his best. So it's, you know, it's not a, there's no, uh, there's no opportunity for him to, to screw up, even if he, you know, stopped eating that way. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Great. (laughs) 
so just based on the tone of this conversation, I feel like I should share uh, because I, I don't know, I feel like I need to. This cross that I'm wearing, it, if you can't see it, there's actually a mustard seed inside of inside of it. And I uh, just yeah. wanted to share with you guys and the rest of the audience this verse that I keep in my uh, phone yes. clip all the time. Yes. I don't know if you can see it, but it's Matthew 17, 20. And it says that uh, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, this is really all you need. You can say from one mountain to the other, move from here to there, and nothing will be impossible for you. So I just wanted to share that with you guys and the rest of the audience based on the tone of the conversation. And thank you so much for letting me be here. Yes, thank you. I love it. And you know, the mustard seed is like one of the smallest seeds Mm -hmm. on earth. (laughs) It's like, and that's Jesus saying like, If you just have this much faith, (laughs) a mustard seed size amount, this is like, yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. God bless you. And uh, Chris, man, thank you so much for being here. This has been. It's been awesome. It's been awesome. You've mentioned your community. Tell people, because I'm sure there's people listening that want to, that feel alone and want to not feel alone on their journey. Um, or have a loved one that could benefit. So how can people get involved in yeah, your I, community? We So I've been doing this for almost 14 years. So you can connect with me and, you know, get resources for me in, in a lot of different ways. But chrisbeatcancer.com is the website. And there's hundreds of articles and interviews with people who've healed all types and stages of cancer. You can search by cancer type in the search bar. And I've interviewed a number of doctors and and researchers and scientists that are also just have this incredible knowledge on the anti-cancer power of food. Mm. Like it's, it's really like, if you want to build up your knowledge and your wisdom and, uh, and your confidence and your faith (laughs) and your motivation, everything on that side exists for that purpose. Uh, you know what I said way earlier in our conversation about the beat cancer mindset is like the number one thing is you have to believe that healing's possible. So everything I do is to that end. That's the mustard seed. That's the mustard seed. That's it. Like everything I do is just to help people get that tiny little seed of faith that healing is possible. Cause I know from there, if they decide they want to live and they take action, then I can help them. Right. I can direct them to resources and information and, and uh, get them like, on their life-changing healing journey. Um, so that's the best place. But of course, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube as Chris Beat Cancer. So there's uh, interviews and content and, and uh, stuff shared there. And um, got three books, Chris Beat Cancer. That's my story and, and what I did. And there's a lot of nutritional science in there. And there's a, a several multi-chapter expose on the cancer industry and the medical industry and pharmaceutical industry. And then a a plant-based cookbook called Beat Cancer Kitchen and a daily devotional, a daily reader called Beat Cancer Daily, which is like 365 pages of inspiration, encouragement, action steps to keep you on the healthy path. Yes, man. So like that's all my stuffs, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot to keep. There's a podcast if you're on Apple, you know, iTunes, the Chris Beat Cancer podcast is there. All the interviews we do, we put them on YouTube, we put them on the podcast. So I'm just putting stuff out, at, you know, everywhere I can to, to hopefully reach people and encourage them. And so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being the light and uh, sharing your story, your wisdom. And I have no doubt it, it uh, what your story's touched me and I have no doubt it's touched so many other people. So thank you for being here today it truly is an honor it truly is an honor. it was an honor to be here man i love it just loved it this is great <laughs> let's go let's go keep going <laughs>